Please. There we go. Hey, Tony. Hi, how y'all doing? I'm sorry, I have to just join by audio today. I'm in transit. I'm gonna wait. I'll put Ryan's in next to and then I'll shut the door. Tony, if possible, just let us know anytime you have to. I know you're behind a wheel or some. I uh, can. Some other spot. I uh, just let us know if you have to drop off. Will do, Mel. Can you hear me okay? Here we are. Fine. Great. Okay. You're coming. Well. Thanks. All right. It's nine thirty. We have a quorum. <laughs> we have a quorum. Could we have a roll call, please? Yes, sir. Brian Hansen. Brian is here. I had to step out of the room. But should we? Oh. Let's see. One, two, three. Why don't we wait till Brian comes back? Well, no, we have Tony on. Yeah. Yeah. Brian is here. He had to step up and take his son to his, his job. Okay. Sounds good. Paul Ham. Here. Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Lohr is absent. Jody Patterson is here. Anthony Waskowitz. Here. Note Wilkins. Here. Um, the minutes ought to reflect that uh, Jerry had informed us that he was going to be at Quantico uh, for um, exercises, so to speak. And so he has been automatically or officially excused from this meeting because there is, as Maggie has educated me, we have to follow a particular protocol and have absence excused or at least notified. Okay. All righty. First item of business is approval of the minutes of the December 21st meeting. So move, Campbell. Paul made the motion to approve the minutes. Second. Anyone like to second? I'll second. Jody, uh, Jody seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, all opposed? No. All righty. We go to the orders. Next item of business. And we have 15 civilian requests and one police request for retirement benefits. Are there any questions on the uh, uh, the retirement uh, requests. I have a motion to approve. Hmm? So moved. Jody uh, made the motion to approve. May I have a second? Paul seconded. Second. Okay, very good. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Just be sure to tell Jerry he's missing all the fun. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we have. Uh, uh, Beneficiaries for uh, unfortunately, uh, death I'm sorry, did you approve the police request? Yeah, we, we did. We did. The, 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 yeah, the civilian and police retirement request we just approved. You approved both of them together? Yeah. Uh, the civilian death uh, re, uh, benefit request, we have no police death benefit request, thankfully. May I have a motion to approve? So moved, Campbell. Seconded. Paul and Jody. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mark to do so. All right. First item of other business now is the performance report by ACG, and we will go directly from that into the asset allocation review asset uh, asset class projections. Thanks, Bill. And so, yes, we have uh, as much said both those things. Um, they're in front of you. Tony, I'll do my best to describe them with very pretty words. The, we have our performance report for the year 2023, which is, we've talked quite a bit about an up and down year, but really ended up being overall a very strong year from a return standpoint. And then we do have, we want to share our updated capital market assumptions. So again, at ACG every year, um, you know, we have expectations, not just for asset classes, but how they work together as they come together to create a portfolio. And so we've kind of updated assumptions as we look out over the next 10 years, what we would expect our portfolio um, to perform, which certainly then within the expectations, we would explain not just what our median expectation is, but the variances around that. So um, provide that with ultimately at the end of the day, we continue to think we're very much on track, our portfolio structure as it is today, moving forward. So we'll get to that. But first, why don't we take out the um, performance report um, which is just simply the one that says St. Louis County Retirement Plans on it. It does not, they both do. One of them says asset allocation review under it, and one of it says nothing. So it's the one that has nothing. 
and December 31st. Right, December 31st. Perfect. So we're down the first page again. I mentioned uh, 2023 really ended up being a strong year, but really kind of you know bounced all over the place. Um, you know, again as a reminder, started 2023 a lot of talk, fears about a recession, um, which ultimately didn't happen. You know, um, consumer continued to continue to spend. Uh, overall, we saw companies continue to hire. In fact, it just came out this morning. The GDP for the past year was up over 3%. So certainly, you know, a strong uh, measure of economic activity. So this led to some kind of very strong news. In the middle of the year, we saw a pullback in the marketplace. Because ultimately, participants, market participants were scared. Actually, things are so good. The Fed's going to continue to raise rates. going to need to raise rates to move forward. So we saw the market pull back quite a bit in the middle of the year. And then really kind of at the end, uh, you know, as the Fed came out, continued to hold interest rates steady, you know, message kind of their expectations that actually, um, you know, they could at least put a halt on this hiking cycle, really brought, uh, you know, really an upswing back to the markets. And you see that here, you know, I want to point out this left-hand graph that we always look at, look at, really how strong the market finished the year. So if you look at the, just first those dark blue lines, these are returns for the month of December. And you can see really just how strong uh, they were particularly led by the Russell 2000, U.S. small cap stocks. Again, U.S. small cap stocks, you know, much more kind of focused here on companies within the U.S. They don't tend to have broad international exposure. So really kind of tends to be a great sign of what uh, investors think about the U.S. economy. You can see for the month of December alone, up over 12%. And you see really positive across the board, both on the equities on the top half and the bottom half, those are those bond indices. You can see bonds, prices rallied quite a bit, again, on expectations that interest rates we're going to drop. Overall, the light blue bars, this is how the major indices ended for the calendar year 2023 year to date. So as we've talked quite a bit about, um, not surprisingly, really the leader of the year, the S&P 500, U.S. large cap stocks, the largest names here in the U.S. stock market, again, really led by a concentrated group of technology focused companies, really kind of on this um, belief AI and kind of excitement about AI from the investment landscape really drove a lot of that. So you can see the S&P was up 26% for the year. But that said, looking kind of at the next couple indices, really kind of strong across the equity indices. The EFA index, international markets developed. So again, Europe, Japan, up almost 20% at 18%. Talked about U.S. small caps finishing the year at 17%. Emerging markets close to 10. Um, and then bond prices, again, really kind of pretty strong, uh, you know, throughout the year. And so, of course, that big theme, if you look to the right-hand side of the page, um, and this kind of speaks to a lot of times, and this I think is very much important to keep in mind as we talk next about our asset allocation going forward. You know, we're long-term investors. We think about what are returns going to be over the long term, but that can be pretty big swings year to year. And we just experienced that very much so here in the last two years. And that's what you can see we've located here on the bottom right of the page. Expect, you know, not, excuse me, not expectations. What happened for these various indices in, in 2022? Those dark blue bars, everything to the left, right? Equities, bond prices. Um, certainly fallen off. And then this, this past year, as we just talked about to the right hand side of the page, very much a rebound in terms of strong returns. Yeah. Can I make yes. a comment? As I recall, if you look at the Russell 1000 or the SP 500, as I recall, nine companies generated about 70% seven total total return. Seven companies. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so very small. Yeah, I, not, well, I, I count nine the way, way I did. Yeah. 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 Google counts count twice, I don't uh, count once. Yeah. Okay. The nine companies represented about 70% of the return of the S&P 500. So it was still a very concentrated return, but a very, a very uh, welcome. For sure. And I'm, I'm really impressed that Jenison uh, was up 53% for the year, which is, of course, uh, Russell 1000 growth was up 43%. Mm -hmm. But Jenison being up 50%, that's I wish we could do that each and every year, but right. unfortunately, that's not possible. But it was really an impressive performance. Yeah, it is. And we'll have, you know, especially so next month, again, we're going to look at some of these return numbers again. We'll have kind of the rear quarterly book to go through it. But Jenison is, is a great example of that. We talk about Jenison a lot here. So remember, 2020, really very similar performance, in fact, to this year. Very, very strong. Again, I think 2020 COVID year, mm -hmm. technology really led that. Yep. And again, we continue to pull, you know, every month as a reminder, we're pulling money out of our portfolio to pay our benefits. Jenison, especially that year, continue to be a strong source of capital for us. 2022, 
growth stocks didn't do too well. Interest rates were rising quite a bit. Um, Jenison got hurt. Look at their three-year number compared to this last year, which is up 52 percent, quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. But then again, you're seeing that swing back. So over a long period of time, we'll see we get the performance board. Jenison has added value, net of fees for a very long period of time in our portfolio, but there's going to be some ebbs and flows in that actually. The other point about the, the seven or nine companies, the concentration of returns, if you look at post October when we got this this year year end rally, um, the S and P 500 equal weight has actually outperformed the S and P market cap weight. So that's what we're going to talk about at the auction and our capital market assumptions. Some people may be surprised, but our capital market assumptions really didn't move too much. Mm -hmm. uh, our intermediate term assumptions, but large cap went up like 10 basis points. And some might say, well, how could the large cap assumption go up if you know, the, the market rallied so much? Well, the seven stocks, if you look at those seven, the, at the PEE or the valuation on the S&P 500 at the end of the year with those seven stocks is like 22 times, which is above the historical average of 17 times. If you take out those seven stocks, the PE on the S&P 500 is right at the historical average of, of 17. In addition to that, earnings expectations are a little bit better, although we're not moving very much at all. I think that the other thing is when, when we look at these capital market assumptions, we look at the last, we're showing the last two years. Maggie was just talking to me about uh, looking at the last three years. We're really back to where we were prior to the significant declines in, in 2022. Just this last week, we're, we're, you're seeing last few weeks, we're hitting all time highs. Well, those all time highs were hit in January 1. And if you recall, when we came in really in 2020, which was a, a good year, and at the end of 2021, which was also a very good year, our capital market assumptions for the next 10 years were very muted. The probability of getting a, a seven or seven and a quarter, seven and a half percent return over the next 10 years, two, three years ago, we weren't the median was not at 7%, we were more like 6.5%. And if you see now where your 10-year return has gone just in two years, we've dropped down the 10-year under 7%. Going forward now, yields have gone up dramatically since the end of 2022, uh, or beginning. the beginning of, of 2022, and valuations from the beginning of 2022 came down about 25%, in that year of 2022. And now we're about, uh, I think I'd say, we, we didn't move too much this year, but the expectations going forward today, just like the beginning of last year, much better than they were two years ago or three years ago, but we felt the, the impact in the portfolio, particularly in 2022. I called it uh, a round trip ticket with a lot of turbulence. Go well, from January of 2022 to December of 2022. It meant there was no difference. There was an awful lot of variation, deviation, volatility, and pain. And, and we know short term performance, and short term is one, two, three years. This, you have an infinite time horizon with your pension liability. So we're investing, uh, allocating assets to, to uh, fund benefits over the next 40, 50 years, presumably, unless something happens. Yep. Uh, Okay, I interrupted you. No, these are all great discussions. Do you have something right? I just because I, I don't think Jason was the main. Um, I, I had a question a few months back, just week when we were kind of um, deconstructing the, our large cap allocation. You may, if this is better for the asset allocation, type, it's fine. But um, when you when you add back in Aristotle and Jenison, we, we bring down the exposure to the the seven names. Now, like it was maybe a percent. Um, and so the question was, would we would we be better served? Because I know the bias is towards passive to 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 do instead of the forty percent active management, kind of satelliting around the, the the passive exposure. Would we be better off doing a uh, uh, S and P five hundred equal weight to really bring down that concentration risk? I mean, the the, the concern with passive to me was the, the I mean, you, it's the, the it's the concentration in those seven names. That'd be one way of mitigating it. It would reduce fees. But like Milt said, I don't. You won't, you're, you're not going to expect "quote unquote" outperformance. In fact, the equal weight oftentimes underperforms the, the yeah, yeah. The, so the market, market cap weight exactly. So, so equal weight. I mean, that in itself is a bet, right? Relative right. to the S and P, um, that you're kind of dividing and you know, splitting your exposure 
um, you know, relative to the market rate. Of and so it kind of just because, you know, we've done the analysis and we've kind of looked back over time. Some years equal weight outperforms, some where the typical market um, cap S&P 500 outperforms. So kind of very long periods of time, but somewhat hence in that out. And so, you know, kind of what we found is, you know, it's, there is, ten, there could be maybe, maybe a little bit less volatility in the equal weight, but ultimately over long periods of time, they tend to have the same performance. You're getting that with your satellite managers. Right. Your active managers right. are going to have typically bring down the market cap a little bit. Yes. Particularly on the value side. It, it was, a, a, I was just trying, it was a cheaper way because it's passive of, of mitigating the concentration risk. Um, but it's not, I, I just wanted to hear from you that you don't think that that would outperform the, the, the active, the, the active instead. Again, now, that be for whether or not we should just carve out a, I wouldn't a, call a new allocation for equal yeah. weight uh, S&P. Yeah. No, that's not, it's right. I would say what I was saying, so. No, I mean, it's, you know, we think our active managers, they've shown over, you know, the time that there are fees to add alpha mm -hmm. that and above um, the benchmark. And so we'd rather have them making those calls in terms of how to be different than broad index. And what's one else talking about? Let's see. Does it make sense to carve out that's an allocation of a run line to put it in RSP, put it in the equal weight S&P 500. Does that make sense? I don't think you way, need another. I'm not sure it does. Fourth man, large yeah. cap manager. I'm not sure it. Yeah. I'm not sure it does, but I think that's the question we ought to address and resolve. Right. Because because I don't think I don't think the active managers bring down the concentration risk to this seven. Now, again, Jenison certainly does. Right. If that's where they bring the money. Well, they are. At this period of time, they were able to over. They were exactly. able to add right. to that, so that benefited you greatly. Uh, uh, they they, can, they can take that Agreed. down. When they, yeah. It's only the, it's only the question. Yeah. Just, if we add, if you're just trying to think out. through, you know, the, the um, Gosh. passive, um, the concentration risk, different ways of. Being, I, I think the active. Um, Acta doesn't mitigate it, but it does give you the opportunity for alpha, right? And so if you if you did um, equal weight and, and market cap weight, you're not really getting alpha. You're just kind of um, really bringing down the market cap exposure. Right. But you get from an equity index, right? The way this is calculated, the winners run. They right. continue to, to get bigger and over time. They're, they're big for a reason. I'll yes, just, right. We'll caveat, that. though. When we talk about asset allocation, we're not. You're using, that, you're using not, market cap weighted indexes. Yes, we're right. We're looking at beta. Our capital market assumptions are, are beta assumptions. We're assuming no value, right? And no fees. Right. Uh, we're not talking about implementation, so that's a different discussion okay. that we can come back to. Okay. Uh, and we're we're happy to you know we can show some backward looking views, uh, which we did when we we increased the passive from zero to sixty percent five years, four or five years ago, what that would look like with the, the, the two satellite managers, mm -hmm. uh, we can revisit that. If we were 100% passive, right. but split between cap weighted and equal weighted, what that would look like. I just know there's been some sensitivity to passive and, and fees, right? And your bias is towards passive and large cap. So what I was trying, my, my reluctance to go more passive is, is the concentration issue. And, and so that, that's that's the only reason I was asked, you know, was asking you to look at it and think of I, it, I think there are valid reasons to not take that approach, yeah. but I, I just was, I just was curious your thoughts on it. So that's helpful. That's helpful. One thing you could do for the next meeting, because this is an urgent, uh, could you bring the analysis or the comparison of the return of the market cap weight of the regular S&P 500 yeah. over time versus the equal weighted sure. S&P 500? Yeah. yeah. Oh, or, or, uh, this is somewhat new to you as a new member of the board. No, I'm it, right. it's the difference between the market cap weight and equal weight. Is that clear to you as well? Yes. Just as a matter of education, I don't think it's compelling to do to do what I suggested, but I think it's a question one can reasonably raise. Uh, good. Yeah. All right. Continue. So, so then I think so. A lot of great discussion, kind of what happened during the year. Just as it relates to our performance, and again, how we ended 23. Page four has our has our 
asset allocation and values. So we finished 23, uh, $840 million in the portfolio. You can see the, the third and fourth columns are our target. You know, it's our target allocation and how we kind of finished over and underweight relative to that target where we sit at the end of the year. So where you can see kind of mainly some overweight equities, underweight fixed income. Not surprisingly, a lot of this move came in the last few months. As again, equities ran up and kind of moved up in our allocation. But again, do know we're pulling money out of our portfolio every single month. And we think it's particularly a strong one to pull some of that back. Uh, within real estate, we do remain you know, a little bit overweight. Uh, our, asset, our target asset allocation, you know, as a reminder, we put that redemption in from Reef last year, actually maybe kind of towards the end of 22. Uh, for $20 million, we've gotten about half of that back so far and do expect some, some more coming soon. So finally, to look at returns, Flip to page five. Again, for the month of December was very strong. We were up over 4%. Uh, looking to that last three months, that's the fourth quarter of the calendar year. Again, kind of this really um, strong move in the market, both in equities and fixed income, as expectations, interest rates would not continue to be raised. So our portfolio in the last three months alone was up over 8%, you know, about 8.4%. You can see about 70 basis points. Ahead of our strategic policy index, again, that's our target asset allocation if we are invested passive. As a reminder, this, these are all returns are all net of fees. So for the calendar year, so again, just kind of show how lumpy things can be. We were up over 8% for the fourth quarter. So for the full year 23, up almost 13%, 12.9% for the year. You can see again about 64 basis points net of fees outperformance relative for our strategic policy index. And guess how much were we down in 2022? Was it 18%? At the total portfolio level? I I need to double check. It was in the teens. I don't know if it was quite 18. 18 seems high. 16.4. Oh, so yeah, okay. So we were, we're up. Um, yeah, okay. So up 12.9 for this year. Um, you can see our broad policy index for the calendar year. So that's, again, that doesn't include real estate. That's pretty much all equity, about 78% equity, 22% fixed income uh, without the real estate there. And it's larger cap bias. It's the equity, yep. not the Russell 3000 and the equity XUS. Right. So there's a lot more large cap in that. But, you know, Milt's point is you look at, you know, kind of a lot of, a lot of turbulence round trip as, as you look at these things. So really strong 2023. You bring in the previous two years, particularly 2022, but also 21, and that three-year annualized return for us is 2.9% per year. But then you bring in the two previous years before that, which was in 20 and 19, you can see we're back up to about a 9% per year return over the last five years. Again, about 60 basis points ahead of our policy index each year net of fees. The real estate uh, number, uh, is that... Uh... Final, final. That is current. That is for 23, yes. That is for okay, fine. No months omitted. No months omitted. Okay. So, yeah, so just looking down that one-year column, and we'll hit on some of our, our manager kind of keynotes in a minute, but just on the one-year column, you can even just see, you know, the top half is equities, returns in the double digits, 20, even 30%, fixed income very positive for this year. But, again, that real estate, you know, down, you know, our portfolio down 9% for the year at the very bottom row. The Odyssey, our benchmark collection of other managers, down quite a bit more than that, over 12 and a half, almost 13 percent. So again, certainly a pullback in real estate this past year, but as a reminder, 22 big protector for us. And so even you add that to the trail in three years, actually real estate was up almost seven percent on a per year basis for us. So actually over the last three years, annualized one of the better performing asset classes. Right. Um, but again, just looking back at the one year, some of the highlights. Um, within our portfolio. So going back towards the top, our large cap equity composite was up over 30% for the calendar year. Um, the index did well, the Russell 1000, but our managers, particularly some of the, um, uh, the allocations with Aristotle and both Jenison, who you mentioned, really you know, added quite a bit to that. We outperformed the Russell 1000 by over 3.5% per year. Um, on the flip side, in our small mid cap, you can see we actually ended up trailing the benchmark this year. It was up almost 17%. We were up about 13%. Um, granted, um, you know, trailed the benchmark. But you can see over those last three years, um, you know, and even kind of longer term, our, our combination of our not, our not large managers continues to add quite a bit of value for us. Do you have a um, detailed 
understanding of how or why they underperform their benchmarks of that. So granted in particular, so if you want to you can flip to the next page. So over the three years, so actually what's a little bit different, uh, we've experienced in small cap versus large cap over the last years. Actually, value has been able to add stronger returns than growth. Again, kind of different on the large cap side. Granted, benchmark to the Russell 2000 does tend to lead a little bit to the growth side. Does tend to kind of focus more so on some of these managers who have, you know, particularly been hurt with the rising interest rate, particularly last year. So that's what's caused them to pull back a little bit. Again, we think they're a good pair with on this, certainly on the value side. But that's what's kind of caused them, particularly over the last three years, um, to have some trail. But again, still high confidence with them. Um, because they've been, you know, ahead of their index because they've been exceptional. Oh, it's just so unusual for Grant to be that far apart, given given history, because I never had a question about them historically. So I just wonder what happened. I, I mean, I think again, relative to the Russell 2000, the core benchmark, they've definitely leaned into some of these kind of growthier areas, growthier companies uh, within the marketplace, which you know, particularly last year. Uh, during 22, it was raised moved up, hurt quite a bit. But again, I mean, this hurt him relatively. I mean, we, there's a lot of, you know, there's tracking error with every manager, right? You got to be careful with the benchmark. That's hurt for And any, any manager can have a bad year. Right. Could have a bad 18 months for that one. Yeah. I'm just wondering if we have a deep understanding as to what happened. I mean, we looking at longer term results and, and rolling results, I think is, is much more instructive. I agree. We know. 100% that we're going to deviate from benchmarks in the in the short term. The objective, the real primary objective is to meet your return objectives from a funding standpoint. Have we talked about it recently? Well, we have. But Listen, I yeah, we have. I don't know if they've been in. They haven't been in. I don't think so. I think we had earnings more recently than Granite. That's even been a while. Yeah, it has been. When we, when we have Granite uh, talk with us, uh, you can pick out a month yeah. that's, that's not yeah. a well, we could definitely do that um but even just you know maybe having to answer any question any of the managers but again we always like to look at that far right hand side of the page of since inception and so again including Madrian, who's still on this performance report yeah uh you know there's 15 different line items of managers that we have 14 of the 15 net of fees since they've been in place have been able to outperform their respective policy benchmarks. Right. The one that, of course, has it is Rumline Passive, which we know there's going to be a fee to that um, and cause it to trail a little bit. Um, so overall, it's, you know, ebbs and flows we talked quite a bit about. We already talked about Genesis, certainly the strong performance they had this year. But even Aristotle, large cap value side, again, able to, to kind of catch up quite a bit this year. Some of its performance. The 10 year number for the total portfolio ahead of the strategic policy and the broad policy. And if, when we look at the asset allocation piece, we're going to show you some quarterly rolling 10 year. So okay. looking at every quarter going back the last five years or 20 quarters uh, on a 10 year look back, every quarter you've outperformed both the strategic and the broad policy. More recently, the more you had in US large cap, the better you would have done because US large cap outperformed everything by a lot. Uh, but we know, you know the past isn't necessarily a predictor of, of the future, but just, just to show, uh, just to give some perspective, last year, large cap outperformed small cap by 16%. So if you had more small cap in your than the yeah. benchmark we're comparing to, that's a little bit of a headwind. Large cap outperformed the ACWI XUS, which is everything uh, international developed and emerging markets by 9%. Mm -hmm. Large cap outperformed bonds by 22% last year, just for some perspective. Over 10 years, um, large cap outperformed small cap by almost 6% over 10 years. International by nine and, and bonds by 11. So looking backward, the more you had in large cap, the better you would have done. But I mean, the more, more you had in large cap growth, the better. That would be even better. Now, at, at, the same, at the same time, would you go back in your records to see who we've had in the strategic plan? Because we've tried to have to meet with each of our managers once over a 14 month period. 
and so I don't, again, granite hasn't been around, or I don't think we've been down around in quite some time. And so it's a good, might be a good place to start. I'm not um, hammering on granite at all. Just, I'm just curious because that seems to be unusual for them. And I just wanted to know. Yeah, we've had the, the international managers and bond managers last year. Yeah. Genesis. Okay, so could you go back in the records to see what we've had in more recently? And let's just start. Uh, let's get back to us right with a, um, a guest list for upcoming meetings. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's probably best not to have anybody for the May meeting, because I think that's when Paul would present the actual um, report and that tends to take up all the oxygen in the room. But other than that, I think it'd be good to have. Oops. We will work on that. All right. Uh, so any other questions on performance before we flip to the asset allocation review? The, the one just update for the group again, I mentioned Mondrian, so we kind of made the decision to, to move their allocation to Silchester. So, just as a reminder, we've uh, sent in with kind of Vicki and Maggie the uh, redemption request for Mondrian that'll be effective January 31st. So, we're invested with them for January 31st. Uh, we will be getting our proceeds back. Um, I think it's the second week, maybe the start of the third week of February, which then we are then more to Silchester by the 25th of February. So we will have that. Um, also, you add to the board, and so we kind of talked a little bit about this, but just to kind of clarify or put numbers around it. So with all these commingled funds that we invest with, it's typical of them that when new money comes in or goes out, whichever client is sending the money in or out pays the transaction cost to get up to speed. To, to get allocated or get the cash out so the current investors don't have to do that. So with Mondrian, it is estimated it would be about a 40 basis point cost to pull the money out. Mm -hmm. uh, Silchester has a cost of 75 basis points to get that allocated. Now, we don't know with kind of either of them, there's a lot of times they try to net that out. What I mean by that is if we're entering Silchester but somebody is exiting, they can sometimes kind of net that allocation together. And so it would avoid some of the costs. So because he's a commingled trust. He's a commingled, yes. The commingled trust, not individual accounts. So if it was an individual account, you'd have the same or higher cost. Right. Because there's transaction costs of buying and selling. Right. So that's just an update for the group. But again, that is documents are underway, have, have been completed, and so for that, and that is the process timeline to, to make that change. To that. Um, with that, okay, we take out our asset allocation review. And, and frankly, you know, the, the first page here, page three, again, what we are looking to do is quite simply is make sure this plan is able to be viable for a long, long, really infinite period of time, as long as we can, um, with kind of working with Paul and the actuary and what the board has set. What that means over time is getting that seven and a half percent return, seven and a quarter, seven and a quarter excuse me, uh, you know, over that period of time. Um, and doing so really, you know, we want to hit that return, but we want to do so with least volatility as possible. And again, why that's so important to us, we're continuing to pull money out of the portfolio. And so we want to make sure um, that when we do look to, to pull capital out, we're able to pull it from areas that aren't significantly depressed in terms of price. Uh, we look kind of impair what, what the principal is there. Just a couple of comments on this. So we review this annually and really not much should change in your strategic asset allocation unless your objectives have changed wildly. And what could be a, a significant change in objective for a pension fund? The primary one would be is to froze the plan. And so we're not a not a going concern. We're going to have a frozen plan, no new entrants. Now, assuming you have a long-term time horizon and a return requirement of north of six and a half, seven percent, you're going to have to have equity market exposure and a diversified portfolio. So really from year to year, there shouldn't be drastic changes. And as we, this year, we're not making any recommended changes to the policy allocation. We're not talking about rebalancing or where money is today. We're talking about the policy targets. And then as Jason kind of mentioned, and for all the reasons earlier, particularly where our interest rates currently are, as well as kind of the landscape in the equity market, particularly expectation for, for earnings growth going forward. There's not a tremendous amount of dip, uh, changes from assumptions we were at this time last year to where we are today. 
Um, I do think what's interesting to look at is you look at page five, what we put here is we actually uh, went back in time 10 years ago and we said, our, what were our capital market assumptions for the next decade 10 years ago? What actually happened and kind of what's that, what's that difference there? And so kind of what you see 10 years ago, you know, we assumed, you know, between equities, U.S., you know, large and small, non-U.S., we'd be getting return around seven, seven and a half percent for some. Fixed income would be a little bit lower because, again, rates were lower at that time. And they tend to match out uh, and real estate would be somewhere in between. And then you kind of look just you can see the next column is what actually happened over the next decade. And this is an annualized return per year for each group. And then that difference, again, not surprisingly, what we found uh, I think we could all have known this where we were 10 years ago. What mm -hmm. out would surprise us to the upside, which we very much all benefited from, was this U.S. large cap explosion, which significantly outperformed where our expectations were a decade ago. What performed well, but maybe not kind of up quite to what our expectations were, were small cap, which really put pretty much right in line. The international, again, positive, but not quite hitting what we had expected relative to a decade ago. Uh, fixed income, as, in, as interest rates continued to drop down, Again, we are reinvesting some of these lower rates. Uh, we didn't earn the return we would expect over the last decade. And real estate kind of came in a little bit to the upside. And so I think it's interesting to check this out, but also again, this kind of helps set our expectations to think about as we think about going forward. If the last decade, US large cap did better than we thought, international small cap, not quite as much, fixed income, not quite as much. It's not surprising that where we think, again, it continued to, to where we think some of the higher returns will be for some of the non-US fixed income. And areas. this asset allocation is an exercise in reasonableness. You're trying to determine as fiduciaries, is the asset allocation strategic mix that we have reasonable in light of our expectations? We know that these capital market assumptions that you see here from 2014, we're not it wasn't, we know it's not going to be that number. Right that, that that that's the 50th question. percentile probability. So from a, a modeling standpoint, we're saying there's a 50% probability that the return of large cap is going to be 6.9% or greater. There's a 50% probability it's going to be 6.9% or less. That 11.8, that was within the range of possibilities. If we looked at a distribution of outcomes, it was probably closer to the 80 fifth percentile or 15 percent probability that so it was really good uh, expectation um, when you mix that all together along with risk assumptions and the risk assumptions are historical standard deviations and correlations which is uh, how historically asset classes have behaved together we get a portfolio expectation a median expectation which we'll, we'll look at uh, here in a minute. Again, that's that median. We're not saying that that's what you're going to get. That's the 50 percentile probability. So 50% is going to be that or higher. 50% will be that or less. Do you recall what the 10 year treasury was 10 years ago? Uh, I'm guessing it was right around, uh, it was, you know, 3.6. Mm -hmm. Probably maybe a little bit lower because the assumptions. Assumption is going to have some credit yeah. right. um, and default, uh, so it was it was probably oh, around three. three. Yeah. Okay. But again, Jason was alluding to this, and page six I think is is a great kind of look back as well. And this is our actual performance, and just again, kind of our goal along which page page six mm -hmm. over long periods of time certainly hit above our that discount rate of seven and a quarter. To kind of just see how this compares and we talk a lot about this within here sometimes you know we look at performance and it's just time period dependent based on this date how does it look but what we're looking at here is again this is rolling so this goes back for every quarter end over the last five years so kind of starting with uh you know march there 2019 every quarter end what our 10-year return was in our portfolio the 10-year return what it was for our portfolio net of fees versus kind of our broad policy index. Again, that's that just equities and bonds, very heavily weighted equities at 78%, 22 bonds. Our strategic policy index, which is our target asset allocation, um, what that was each quarter. And then we also put in here, you know, again, if you guys remember every quarter end, we compare our, our performance versus that of what we consider our peers. Other public pension plans here in the US that have somewhere between a hundred million and a billion dollars in their portfolio. Every situation is different, but again, we think they're, they're very you know, similar enough peers to us. 
again, as you how we rank in each quarter rent for the last decade is a reminder one's the best, hundreds the worst. So what you can see kind of really looking back across these various time periods, is first and foremost, really very strong absolute returns as we look back, you know, certainly many of the years on a per year basis, over 8%, 9 even 10 a few times. Um, it has fallen off more recently, again, particularly given what happened to 22, but as we continue to add strong years like 23 on it, we do expect that to move back. You can also see pretty consistently our performance versus both on a 10-year basis, the broad policy index or strategic policy index. And you can see we've averaged those, um, all three of those, and that's what that box is there. So if you were to average all these quarter end periods, that's what it would be. And then, of course, relative to our peers, you can see pretty much almost always in the top quartile, 25%, maybe a little bit outside that. You can see on average over the last five years, on a rolling 10-year basis, our average has been right just outside that top quartile, top 27% percentile versus peers. Um, so, well, just looking over long term, and this is really how we should be looking at it for a pension portfolio. Long, not, we're, we're always focused coming in every month and we talk about the last month, the last quarter, and last year. Long-term time horizons. So we're looking over longer-term time horizons. You've outperformed your objectives, both on a relative, well, from a relative basis and an absolute basis for the most part, which is that seven plus percent return. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that's instructive here is you see that the movement of the total return really is tracking those those benchmarks which is an indication that asset allocation is really driving returns over time for the total portfolio, much more so than individual Managers. managers or, or security selection at the manager level. Now, we're pleased that you've outperformed those metrics, but it's the asset allocation that is, is driving returns. So then just, you know, looking forward, we just, do you know what the, you've got the average 10 year return? Do you, do you know which the median is? Oh, the median of this group? Yeah. That's a great question. I don't. Okay. I, I can figure it out. Yeah, give me a couple of minutes. If you want to. <laughs> well, I, I was just curious because our, our seven and a quarter percent discount rate, it looks like we only underperformed that in three times. Yeah. Then what with one of them being 7.2%. Now, again, this is looking at quarterly performance. So from an accounting basis, it's going to, you're only measuring <laughs> one point of time. Right. Every year. Right, right. Okay, right. And just looking at our five year versus 10 year performance, we, we, it's almost 200 basis points higher, or a little more than 200 basis points higher, 260 basis for the five year than the 10 year. So the, the first five years of that 10 year period must have been a struggle. I don't know that it was the fall five, it was a couple of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, I saw before I was here, but yeah. The tantrum was yeah, 13, 13 or 14. 18. Yeah. So that was a down, at the beginning was a down year. So, and then you know, we, we've talked about this, and ultimately, again, this is long term from a capital market expectation standpoint. There's not a tremendous amount of changes we expect over the asset classes from today or, or a year ago. Um, and so, not surprising, we aren't recommending any specific changes to our asset allocation today. You know, what we did is we put together on page seven, where we have our, our target asset allocation here on the left, and then what our current allocation is on the right. Um, you know, kind of one just difference in there. You know, we did take, you know, Mondrian's assets and kind of put them how we would bucket so Chester. But really the biggest difference, besides just currently how we're over and underweight, a little bit overweight equity, underweight fixed income, but is that private equity. Again, as we know, we started a private equity program a few years ago that takes a, you know, a little bit to ramp up. But really those being the big differences between those two. Um, but as you can see, um, you know, kind of 10 year expected return going forward from now. Again, this doesn't include any assumption of manager value add or, you know, outperformance from that standpoint. It's kind of just over 8% on a per year basis. Um, so, certainly, again, kind of we, we review this every year, but well within our expectations, as Jason said, that reasonable this task. But again, I think that is very important to say, and we alluded to this. This is when we run this, we take all of our assumptions for asset class, our assumptions for volatilities. 
the correlation, how they work together. And we run this through tens of thousands of trials of what could potentially happen over a five year period, over a 10 year period, over a 20 year period from our portfolio. Where you're looking at this 10 year expectation, that's the median. So again, in other words, from all these trials we run, 50% of them did better than this, 50% did worse. And so just to kind of visually see how that shakes out, you can see that there on page eight. And again, this is what this model shows. Again, after a one year, after five years, after 10, which we just, I showed you, I just mentioned, and then after 20 years, you know, what you can see, we run these you know, various trials, these asset classes, and the 50th percentile in that 10 year, like I said, it's over 8%. It's a little bit higher over the shorter, over the five and the one year. But I think, you know, it's, it's important to look at too, that 75th percentile and that 25th percentile. Statistically speaking, both are equally likely to happen, particularly relative to the 50. And you can see what we can say there is, you know, that's somewhere between it would be from 20th percentile lower than we're looking for, but on the 75th percentile, you know, certainly quite better. So over 10 years, there's a pretty good likelihood that your return is going to be somewhere between five and a half and 10.8. That's what, that's what that's saying. And there's 50% probability. The other thing to keep in mind, the one year, you'll see how wide the range of outcomes is in one year. That narrows over time. So we know in any one year, the range of outcomes could be very wide. Last year, down 16.4%. Mm -hmm. This year, up 13. We know we're never going to be at that 8% in any one year. Over, it's going to move around. Over time, the range of outcomes is narrowing as we move out over 20 years, which is probably more realistic to look at for a pension fund, that the, the 25th to the 75th percentile is somewhere between 6.5 and 10.3. And Back to that, re, you know, the other, so the point of this exercise is to say that this asset allocation is going to generate a reasonable probability of achieving your target rate of return. So the target rate being 774 today. today. And we'll argue later whether or not that should be higher or lower. We, we would, we would, we're more conservative. We would keep, sure. we wouldn't move it as quickly. Cause if you look at the next page, probability is another way of looking at it. It's still, it's, this is better. I would, so I referenced two years ago when we looked at this, two years ago, the probability of seven and a quarter was not 50% based on our capital market assumptions. Mm -hmm. So you're not alone relative to your peers in slowly moving that, ratcheting that return assumption down in a period of time where the, the go forward was pretty hard to make a case based on most folks' capital market assumptions that you could get there. Today, our expectations are better because interest rates are higher than they've been over a decade. Valuations globally are a little bit better. So the probability of seven and a quarter percent is north of 50%. So that, that's a pretty good probability. And that's a reasonable, where we were stretching, you would have had to take this out to 30 years to get to a 50% probability. The other thing that I think- Do I interpret this correctly, that the probability over 20 year period, the probability of getting 7.5% is 60? Four percent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's we'll, much better. We'll revisit this, but that that seems to be. So, like, if you think back to 2022, when we had that that big adjustment down in the fixed income we did, um, and we were talking about our funded ratio at that time, mm -hmm. we made the point that government obligations were were repriced, but we hadn't repriced our discount. Our discount rate was still still that that, that seventy quarter. This is kind of, I think this is reflecting that there's that that we have I think what we're just kind of reverse engineering what the actuary put together the weighted average maturity of our benefit obligation right now is was a little over ten years. Um, so so looking at the shift in either municipal bond rate or or you want to use the treasury whatever. Um, that, that's a good proxy for what our benefit obligation was. So, I, I mean, cause it's, it's a, it's a government obligation. And so it, it just struck me that leaving it now, maybe we were too high going into it at seven and a quarter. That might not have reflect maybe, maybe it should, we should have been working it down lower. Um, so I, I, I'd be okay, you know, from a caution standpoint, 
branching up, but I, I do think our discount rate was there. There was there was a move in the bond market that that um, was a lot more severe than what what we were doing. So the last thing I just want to point out for for all the board members to appreciate is on page ten, and this is one of the downside with an asset mix like this that's at north of 60 percent in equities and 15 percent in real estate this is looking at downside probabilities and here i'll focus on the one year uh, and if you look in the table at the top the zero percent hurdle that's saying your current portfolio has a 28 percent probability of being flat to negative in any one year so that that's important for people People understand that's a pretty high probability that you could be flat to negative. But to uh, to get that down to say, if you said we don't want to lose money, we want this portfolio constructed in a way where that probability of zero or less is below five percent. Well, that's going to have almost no equities, and it's going to be significantly very short duration in, in investments. And if you have a seven and a quarter or higher uh, type of portfolio uh, objective, you just can't do that. So I think this is important to know. Then the last thing um, I'll point out is on the page before the one percent probability. And this is we're not really showing you multiple mixes here. If we if we were, this is another measure that we look at. But so on page, eight, page eight again in the one year, looking at the one year that first percentile that's a good way to envision a worst case scenario saying in any one year there is a one percent probability that this asset mix could be down almost 21 percent 2008 i don't know what this portfolio was in yeah. 2008 but uh, we had a lot of plans that we worked with that were similarly allocated we're down about 22 percent at 2008, you know, the financial crisis. That would have been in about the 0.5 percentile. So it was within the range of potential okay. outcomes. 0.5 or something. But it, it, it's a worst case scenario. So we show that as just an understanding that's of that. Right, that's that's a possibility. I think the better way to understand it is think there's about a 30 percent probability that this portfolio could be flat to, to negative in any given year. Over time, that narrows considerably. Over a 10-year period, and this is back on page 10, uh, over a 10-year period, um, it's it's much, much lower. So yeah, over that, what this is saying, so you, if we're back on page 10, this 10-year, 10 so that minus 20%, what this is saying is over the next, over a 10-year period, there's a, of our, Current portfolio, there's a 21% chance any one year in a 10 year period you could be down 20%. As a similar portfolio, what, what would the example of a year where, where we would have a 33% portfolio return? 30, well, I think for the one year. Because that, that's, the, that's the 99th percentile, right? So if, well, if 20 or 21 was, I mean, it wasn't 33%, but it was probably close to 20, yeah. one of those years. 2009. Uh, right. Yeah, so those are the types of, yeah. Yeah. So this is yeah. informational today. We're not making any recommendations to do anything. It's just we, we revisit this annually. Uh, but the only thing we did, we typically talk about our long term assumptions as well. These are intermediate term. So it's looking at over 10 years as opposed to over 30 plus. Just a reminder, our intermediate term assumptions, while well, it is still long term to many, 10 years, uh, they're anchored more, they move around, tend to move around a little bit more from year to year based on yield and valuation, where the long term are fairly constant because those are based on very long term averages. That said, the intermediate and long term assumptions have, they're not exactly the same but they've converged over the last couple of years they're much closer to one another so there's not that big of a distinction and that's because rates rates have come up and valuations have, have come down 
couple of years ago, they were pretty far apart. One recommendation you did make was that we not change asset allocation. This Correct. Correct. So, do you feel comfortable how we're allocated? And, and how we're and allocated moving toward and, 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 and looking at your numbers, how we're allocated in theory, at least at the 50% interval, probably closer to 64% in theory, should deliver, if not exceed our current. Uh, 7.25%. Yeah, and it also requires working toward the target allocation because we're not there. Yeah. We're not we're we're not at six and a quarter percent in private equity. I think that's also part of the showing the current it's less efficient, lower expected return than the than the policy. Yeah. Not not significant difference, but we're moving toward that policy. Yeah, so Mel, you had you had talked about a list of managers to come in. So certainly portfolio advisors is one of those we would like to have in. Um, not just to hear what they're doing, but also, again, we, we made that commitment, that first $60 million commitment to private equity two years ago now. And so we certainly want to kind of revisit, rerun our commitment models uh, here in 24 to you know, likely make another commitment to continue to, to actually get us closer to target from it. So that would be April, the, is that what we agreed from? Why don't we put together, we'll put together a full year calendar and portfolio advisors particularly, yeah. not before April. Okay. We'll work on a calendar. But There's a reason for that. Yeah. Well, well, we can put it together like a, a plan and you can share it with you and Becky and say, well, we've got other, we've got actuary this month, we've got auditor this month, what makes sense. Right. Well, thank right. you guys, but there's something that really confuses me. Yeah. And um, the first deck we established uh, uh, 2023 had a performance significantly better than 2022, as illustrated on page three. Okay, then I want to come to the second one on page six, and it shows the same 6.8 under December 23, um, which agrees with early year actual performance for the year of 2023. But if you go left and look at December 22, it's showing 7.28. How is that higher? 10 year returns. These, so these are 10 year returns. So what this looks, so basically the difference between December 22 and December 23 is uh, you added 23, but you would have dropped off. You added a year and dropped off. It dropped one from uh, the beginning. Okay. And so looking back on that, so that probably would have been 2013. Okay. With. So it's just coincidence that our 10 year as of December 23 is the same as one year? No, no, no. But the, that number in the ASAP, this so, 10 year period, those are all, every one of these periods is ending December 31, 2023. Amen. That's 10 years. I gotcha. I'm sorry. No, you're good. No, I'm good. So if you looked so over you, the one year no, return, 12, I got it. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. Alrighty. Anything further? Any other questions or observations for ACG? All right. Other items of business. This would be anything you would, uh, the board would particularly like to discuss at our next meeting. Or other items of business you would like to bring up now. So we have correspondence. We have um, correspondence. Uh, which is included from Mr. Uh, Goku. That's acknowledged. Thank you for submitting it. And we have visitor comments. There are any? Please. Good morning. Um, I'm Scott Mark, the police department. Yeah. My question is for the board. Um, told us there's a place to go. What is going on with our pension soft program? Your what? The pension soft program that was implemented for the employees to go in and figure out their benefits for retirement. I was told to start here. I don't know if this was the place to start at, but the pension soft program has not been accurate for probably six to seven months. I plan on retiring May the 1st. Uh, ran my numbers and the number for my salary for last year in 2023 is off by over $22,000. 
which makes a big difference in my pension, which makes it hard to go to a tax advisor and ask my tax advisor how much taxes need to be brought out for federal taxes. Um, the other question is, knowing that the pension saw program is not accurate, and when you go up to benefits and you ask for your packet, and they give you your packet, they give you the exact information that's on pension soft. They don't give you the information that you need to go to your tax person to get their tax information and all your paperwork filled out properly. So you can have it turned in 30 days prior to your retirement, like it's stated needs to be done. It's true for you. It's true for a lot of people. Then. Uh, who's, who's are the, are the benefits were approved coming from? No. Okay. No, I do. Yeah. Okay, Officer Martin, I'll, I'll contact you directly. I'm Matt Levin, CHR Director. And so we'll take a look at your particular case and, and make sure that your numbers are sound. Yeah, I just know. I mean, you're, you're, you're actually who's responsible for, for correcting the system. This is a mechanical problem. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you're not I was told that this was a, not only a mechanical problem, this was a problem that the license had expired and they were waiting for the approval to get it reapproved and then get the approval from up above to import all the payroll information so it updates the numbers so people can go in and get their yeah the license matter wouldn't be handled by the board that's an I, I understand it that's kind of that's that was what i was told i don't know how i heard that was all i know is that as of two nights ago when i went pension soft again mm -hmm. ran my numbers again my salary for 2023 is off by over twenty two thousand dollars I was told when I talked to somebody at benefits, and I understand that there are some things that don't get included into our pension, as such as uniform allowance and things like that. I get $12.50 a paycheck for uniform allowance, mm -hmm. added out over a year. That does not equal $22,000. And I don't know what else. Her, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can tell by my shoes, I don't have $22,000 shoes. So anyway, that's just where I'm at. Like I said, I want to retire. At first, hopefully, and it's kind of hard to get everything in line well, when all these numbers off. And then it's just not affecting me. Yeah, there's obviously a lot people out there to do that. There's a so problem in the system that affects that, everybody. That are off way, way higher than what my salary was off. So. Are you talking about the mypensionbenefit.com calculations? No, it's a, it's the program that was implemented maybe, what, a year or two years? It, it's been it's that long ago? A well, while. Anyway, it's called Pension Soft. Um, you can go in there and put down whether you're a civilian or a commissioned employee, mm -hmm. your expected date of retirement, your expected date of getting benefits, and if you have a spouse, it prints out all the scenarios as far as what you're going to get if you do 100%, 50%, 66, and two thirds. Yeah. I've been doing that on that mypensionbenefit.com. Is it a different calculation site? I believe you you get into pensionsoft.com and it may reroute you. It reroutes. I see. That's what it is. Yeah, we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. All right. Your, your uh, concern is, well, I, like is shared and, and, and noted. And yeah, just, we will simply ask Matt, I'll follow could you get on that? And obviously, there's, and there's just, mechanical as well as administrative okay. process someplace. Right. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, for Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other visitor comments? Before I do, there seems to be a large discrepancy on these reports. The the 680 10-year figure, and then your figure on your asset allocation is 8.49 for the same decade. So how could it be eight? If you look at page six of your asset allocation and your page five of the first thing that you come to ask us. One is 8.49, the other one. Now it's got a little subscript there that says it doesn't include the month of December, but I can't believe one asset month. allocation is forward looking. That's backward looking. If we not, should I? It's, it's, it's not the end of the. I, mean, I suppose so. If we can make this quick, this, Mr. Gokin only has three months. <laughs> the 8.49 versus the 6.8? Yeah. Uh, the 8.49 is the average of all of the, um, these are all these are the quarter and 10 year numbers. So 8.49 average is all of the, so it's not an average return. No, no, okay. so it's just all right. average all right. Like a, a report. All right. Uh, well, I hopefully you guys read what I said to you. 
the board seems to be more interested in its allegiance to active management orthodoxy than it is in being a fiduciary to St. Louis County and its retirees. I'm not sure what a 40 year track record of a simple 60 40 portfolio that outperforms the St. Louis County plan. My $333 million can be faulted for. Oh, wait, it is not diversified. In 40 years, it's just not long enough for diversification to show its advantages. St. Louis County and its retirees can ill afford to see if it takes another 40 years for active management and diversification advantage to emerge, only to find out, find out we're further in the red. ACG has said that this is hindsight, but all comparisons are hindsight. So I showed how the comparison did over the last decade, and you were all for giving that information. And it was also devastating for St. Louis County Plan. Did not have the 20, I did not have the 2023 data provided by ACG when I sent this information to you. However, the data for 2023 and the decade of 2014 to 2023 was even worse than the decade of 2013 to 2022. In 2023 alone, the 6040 portfolio I gained the St. Louis County Plan by 526 basis points, or 5.26%, 18.16, 12.9, which came to a loss of St. Louis County of over 41 million. For the decade of 2014 to 2023, the St. Louis County portfolio averaged 6.8 per year to the 6040s, 8.42% per year. You do not even want to know that debt. It is only one year I grant you, and I, I do not want to pour it on, but the private equity did even, didn't even outperform the cash. It seems to me the board has a decision to make, keep accepting mediocre results and poorly serving St. Louis County and its retirees or start making changes this data testifies to. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments. We do have someone in we would ask if anybody online would like to. Um, what do we have online? I said, see what I say. Yeah. Marion, did you have anything you'd like to add? Good question. Except that uh, the agenda that was posted on the county website did not have the correct information to get into the meeting either um, online or by phone. I struggled uh, to get into the meeting today. It was only when I clicked on the item four on the agenda where it, it shows agenda. There's a different agenda listed there than the one on the website in terms of signing on. So I would appreciate in the future if when it's posted days ahead of time that it would have the correct um, web address and also phone number. Noted. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Any other visitor comments? Well, Brett, I don't know who Brett, is that Brett Butler or Brett? Scarlet, is she Scarlet there? No, just right. All righty. Fine, I presume there are no other visitor comments in it. This is going to make a quick comment. Please. I'm Joyce Kula, retiree of St. Louis Court of St. Louis County. Yes, I've been retired for six years. This is my seventh year. And I guess I, I'm very confused about we come come to the meetings and I know that I'm not financially savvy or investments and that kind of thing, but I have done studies of other public pension plans in the state of Missouri, and we are the only one that doesn't do a yearly COLA review, and the only one that it took from 2005 to 2022 to even grant a COLA, and not having had a raise in the last 10 years that I worked, in the six years that I've been retired, I have had no increase and no call. Just saying it's really kind of hard to keep up. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. 
All right, we are going to go into closed session. We need a motion to go into. Yeah, I'm ready. We're going to go into closed session and then we'll come out of. Out of closed session just to close the meeting. So if. If our visitors can excuse themselves, there's, you're not going to miss anything. There's not going to be any other. Opportunity to discuss anything after the closed session is over. Okay, can I have a motion to go into closed session? So move, Tampa. I have a second. Brian seconded. Right. Let's wait for. Um, Tony, you still there? I'm sorry. Tony's already in the breakout session. Hey, he's the end. And Paul should be. Uh, we need a motion. We, 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 we have a second. We just need a roll call vote. Okay, let's. Um, Tony is on. Is Tony yeah. in? Let's have a roll call. If Tony is in. Tony is in the breakout session currently. It won't officially end, so I can start it again for the break. Second, he'll be. I, I can restart it again. He's in there now, so he probably can't hear. Yeah, he needs to come back. Oh, I'm sorry. And then we'll roll call and get into closed session. My coach, that's all I can say. It's about the same thing. I'm sure I had a blanket. Oh, God. Say it. Oh, he. I think you're very smart. <laughs> <laughs> all the way. Yeah. Tony, can you hear us? Okay. This is Tony. Okay. I can hear you. Yeah. All right, Tony's on. We could do that's bad, but you know, they have fees because it's all public information. They shouldn't have access to all the discussion, which comes for such reasons. We're ready for a vote. All right, clause here. All righty, very good. All right, Brian Hansen here. Tell them, would you say A or yes or no to go into yes? Thank you. Okay, I was doing that wrong. Paul Hamble. All right. Lieutenant Colonel Joe absent. Jody Patterson? Yes. Anthony Waskowitz? Yes. Milton Wilkins? Yes. Okay. okay, the subject matter is really our contract for renewal with Foster and Foster. Hold on just a second. Yeah. You can start the breakout. The tech piece needs to catch up with us. Sorry.
Hello, everybody. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty, so we are moving to um, use this uh, laptop uh, to uh, return back to open uh, session. You're back. back in open session. I have a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved, Apple. Second. Second. It's a horse race. Should I? Okay, okay, fine. Brian, second. All those in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. Done. We are now adjourned. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh.